morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome you to our service of worship this morning here at the First Congregational Church of Boylston. We are happy to know that many of you are watching on WBAC or the internet. My name is Laurie Costello and I am the worship leader today. I will also be reading the scriptures. We are pleased, as always, to have Charles Wachuku as our organist. Our minister is Pastor George Cole. At this time, if you need to communicate anything or need assistance, please call Pastor Cole or the church office at 508-869-2027. If you need food or need someone to go out and run an errand for you, so you don't have to take the risk. We have a list of healthy young people who will do that. Please call the church, Michelle Simler, or Pastor Cole. If you have a prayer request or a note of praise to share, send it to Pastor Cole by Friday evening. Make sure you specify whether it is just for church leadership to pray or if it is something for someone we can pray for during our broadcast. We still want to show care for one another during this difficult time. And now Pastor Cole has a few announcements he would like to make. Yes, we do indeed. Uh, thank you for joining us today on the uh, telecast. And uh, I don't know how you're doing with sheltering in place, but um, uh, I don't know. I prefer a different lifestyle if possible, but it has helped me understand my dog a little better because uh, when Martha says, do you want to go for a walk? I get really excited. And, uh, and then, you know, when I go for a car ride, I can almost understand that feeling of wanting to stick my head out the window. But uh, anyway, I hope you're doing better with it than I am. But uh, that's something we have to do right now. And, and we're doing that. You know, maybe uh, in time, uh, we'll be able to let more and more people uh, into the sanctuary in the meantime. We're following the lead of our governor, following the lead of the uh, CDC, and, and so forth. For today's service, could I ask you to uh, get your Bibles, uh, if, if possible, and turn to uh, uh, Psalm 41. We're going to be preaching our way through that in, in just a little while. And maybe this would be a good time to mention, too, that next week we're going to be doing communion together. and. Uh, <coughs> So you might just want to have some uh, juice and crackers or bread on, on hand for that as we prepare for that service. But this week, a lot of you received word about uh, the uh, Around the Word in 80 Days Bible Study, and the sign-up has been pretty amazing to me so far. Uh, but I, I do want you to be aware that basically what we'll be doing we won't be going through this book, but we'll be going through material that amounts to a, a trade book of 200 pages. And so uh, just want to make sure you're counting the cost here as you consider that. Uh, and when I say cost, I mean in terms of time, not in terms of dollars. We're, to save dollars, we're sending it out digitally to people. But uh, in order to uh, uh, include everyone, we will provide hard copies uh, if you uh, make a request for that. And we'll start on May 1st, and uh, we're even hoping to have some Zoom meetings where people can check in and ask questions and share uh, their thoughts and comments about what they've been reading. And so, uh, you know, if you're interested in that, email me or call the church, and uh, they'll certainly get word to me. So uh, let's, um, let's open up with a word of prayer. Our God, we acknowledge that you are the sovereign God that rules over this universe. And we acknowledge our utter dependence upon you. Uh, the coronavirus has reminded us of our mortality. It reminds us of how frail and powerless we can be. And so we repent of our self-sufficiency and our arrogance. Lord, the earth is full of your beauty and your goodness, and we experience it every morning. But the virus has come to destroy the quality of our lives, and for some, 
to destroy their lives as the virus looks for ports of entry into our bodies and spreads its vile sickness across the entire globe. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy and turn back this tide, we pray. Give wisdom to our civil and medical leaders, wisdom beyond their own. Protect those in the medical profession as they stand on the front lines of this war and provide them with all they need to fight it. We pray for the scientists and those working on immunizations and treatments. Help them make the discoveries that will lead to us having a victory over this disease. And in the meantime, help each of us to persevere in doing our part. For us as soft Americans, it's been a long haul. Uh, we're not used to this lifestyle. And uh, we pray, however, that you'll enable us to persevere in it. Holy Spirit, comfort our troubled souls. Help us to experience the peace that transcends understanding. Give the courage that we need. Grant us the assurance of eternal life with you and not be dreadful of death, that enemy that will one day overtake all of us in one way or another, but fill our lives with hope. And we pray for people all over the world to be humbled and to turn to you in repentance and faith. Use this service that's before us today to help our congregation and our viewers to strengthen their connection to you and to each other. And we pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
The first reading is from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 5 through 6, and may be found in the New Testament of your Bibles at home. Hear the word of the Lord. Keep our lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? The next reading is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 8, verses 23 through 27, and may be found in the New Testament. Hear the word of the Lord. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A windstorm arose on the sea, so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was dead calm. They were amazed, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? The final reading is from Psalm 46, verses 1 through 11, and may be found in the Old Testament. Please open your Bibles and hear the word of the Lord. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Lord, we ask your blessing on the reading and hearing of your holy word. Amen. Well, as of yesterday, there were 34,402 known cases of the coronavirus in the Commonwealth, and uh, 1,404 deaths have taken place so far. Psalm 46, which was just read, has come to my mind a lot in these troublesome days. Uh, it was written by the sons of Korah. Uh, they wrote this psalm to, to bolster the strength of God's people in a time of crisis. And we cannot discern exactly what the crisis was. I mean, sometimes we read a psalm and we can pretty much identify um, what the background to it is. In this case, we can't. But there was some crisis that the people were dealing with. And um, what uh, the sons of Korah are saying is that God will be three important things to us in a time of crisis. Number one, he'll be our refuge. Number two, he'll be our strength. And number three, he'll be our helper. Let's, let's just dwell on each of those for just a few moments. First of all, he will be our refuge. He'll be the place where we go for shelter, the place where we go to hide for security. Uh, he'll be our protector. 
Now, it doesn't mean that if we're in a time of war, we couldn't be inflicted by a wound or death. It doesn't mean that during the war against the coronavirus that we couldn't become infected by it. Uh, but it does mean that God will protect our hearts from being overwhelmed with anxiety. It says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 that uh, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer and with supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And here's the promise. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so that word guards your heart and mind, it's a military term. And it's almost like if this is the heart and we're praying, God posts a guard around our heart so that anxiety can't get to it. But I don't wonder if the next verse in Philippians is related to this whole idea where it says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And it, it makes me think that we've got the heart, God's put it at peace, he's posted a guard around that heart in order to keep it from anxiety, but we have a role to play, and that is to keep our mind focused on wholesome things. And I'm not sure by listening to the news broadcasts hour after hour after hour, we're keeping our minds on wholesome things. I think the news broadcasts can be very easily attacking uh, our peace and, and destroying the peace that's uh, in our hearts. If you think about it, the media loves things that cause anxiety because it keeps people glued to the television set or to the, the news broadcasts. And the more people are glued to it, the bigger market share they get, and the bigger market share they can testify to, the more advertising dollars they can bring in. And uh, so it's really a combination of things that the media is doing. On the one hand, they do have to provide, according to FCC regulations, uh, a uh, community service, but they're all about making money. And, uh, and they exploit these opportunities like snowstorms and like coronavirus in order to grasp for a bigger market share so they can charge more for their advertising so they can um, make more money. You see, and what we end up doing is we end up watching their breaking news, which means we know one teensy weensy bit more than we did an hour ago. Uh, and so my suggestion is, you know, instead of spending so much time meditating on the coronavirus and the crisis that's around us, why don't we let God maintain the guard around our heart and spend more time in prayer and spend more time meditating on wholesome things like the word that he has given to us. But secondly, it says that God will be our strength. Um, he'll be our enabler. He'll give us the power we need, uh, the wherewithal we need to get through the crises of life. And uh, I kind of picture it like uh, uh, a pneumatic tire. That is a tire that needs to have air pumped into it. Um, you know, if you got a, a brand new tire and took it home and put it on your car and tried to take off with it without putting air into it, you know, it would not work the way tires are supposed to work. Uh, you would destroy the tire, in fact. But, you know, if you take and inflate it with the proper amount of air pressure, now that tire can withstand uh, the conditions that lie ahead of it. And even so, we need to be inflated with strength from God as we go through any crisis in life, including the corona crisis. We need to be strengthened uh, by God. We need to be inflated by God with the strength that we need to go through it. 
Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10 says, the Lord says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my right hand. And then the third thing that God will be to us is an ever-present help in times of trouble. Uh, he'll be right there uh, with us, going through the trial with us and providing us with whatever assistance we need. Lori just read from Hebrews 13, God has said, never will I leave you or forsake you. And so we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. It reminds me of a, a story I heard, you know, I don't know, at my age you'll lose track of time, but I, I think it was about 20 years ago on the news, there was a, a, a grandfather and a grandson that were flying in a two passenger plane together. And sadly, the grandfather had a heart attack that proved to be lethal. And the grandson knew nothing about flying. And as the, the plane was going, all he knew was how to use the radio. And he called for help. And uh, they were able to somehow quickly work it out so that another plane an identical make was able to pull up alongside of the young lad and was able to give him step-by-step -step instructions on bringing that plane to a landing. I mean, that's what God does for us. He comes, he's an ever-present help in trouble. He comes alongside of us in order to assist us through the crises of life. But as we move on now to verse two, I, I love those four words. We will not fear. You see, with God as our protector, with God as our strength, with God as our helper, we will not fear. There's a defiance in that. There's a, a resolve in that. That as I'm going through a crisis, uh, we will not fear. It reminds me of something that one of my favorite authors, A.W. Tozer, said in one of my favorite books, The Knowledge of the Holy, which is not like the knowledge of the people who are holy, it's the knowledge of the Holy One, uh, in, in other words, knowing God. He said, the person who truly believes that God is as he has revealed himself in scripture to be is immediately relieved of 10,000 earthly cares. I love that quote, I've held on to it for years. Um, there is a relationship between fear and faith. Uh, and uh, when Jesus was in that boat and the waves were coming over the side of the boat, he was asleep in the boat. And the disciples were anxious and worried in the boat. They were afraid that they were going to die. They woke Jesus up and asked him to do something and he rebuked them. And I, I, to me it seems a little harsh, but he said to them, um, you know, uh, oh gosh, how did it say? Um, he said, oh, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Uh, and see, there's a relationship between faith and fear. And where there is faith, there's reduced amounts of fear and vice versa. But I do need to, to clarify this just a little bit and that is that, uh, you know, just in the, uh, to be fair to everybody, uh, we're born with a certain temperament and some of us are born more wearisome, uh, worrisome and others are born more uh, uh, easygoing. So that's a factor. Uh, also our upbringing, what our family kind of taught us about what to worry about, what not to worry about uh, is a factor. And also our life experiences, if we've experienced trauma, you know, we know of this thing, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, if we've experienced trauma, that can also affect our levels of anxiety. My point is we don't all start in this growth in faith and this growth in overcoming anxiety at exactly the same point. But at whatever point we're at, the Lord wants to see our faith grow. And I think that's testified to in the words of Jesus where he said, why are you so afraid, O oh, you of little faith? 
And so, um, uh, so let, let, let's grow our faith. Uh, I don't know if uh, any of you remember this book. It was quite popular back in the 60s. Uh, it's called Your God is Too Small by J.B. Phillips. And uh, what he was basically saying is that, you know, God's not small. God's big enough for any crisis, but uh, our understanding of him is often too small. Uh, and our faith in him is often too small. And so he challenges us to have a, a big view of God and to have faith in that big view of God, which is exactly what the sons of Korah are doing in verse 2. Notice that. We will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with surging in other words, these natural catastrophes that just change the topography of the world. Uh, I went to Mount St. Helens uh, uh, National Park and uh, it's just absolutely amazing when you go to the visitor center there. Uh, they have maps, uh, topographical maps of what it was like before the volcano and after. I mean, roads have moved, lakes have moved, uh, rivers have moved, I mean this thing was you know, catastrophic to the, to the region. Um, and it seems like the sons of Korah are talking something about something like that here. And then the waves, uh, dreadful waves. I remember we were going through that uh, 17 mile Chesapeake uh, Bay tunnel and bridge that connects Delaware and Virginia. And uh, it was a horrendous night. They said there were 16 foot surges. And so I got out with my little kids and uh, you know we, we stopped at this one rest area that's on this uh, thing and uh, just watched those waves. Absolutely dreadful. Well, I mean, that's as close as my experience has come to what they're talking about. And they say their, their, their point is that even if uh, things are that catastrophic, uh, we will not fear because God is bigger than any crisis. That, that's the point they're trying to make. Now, I'm sure if they actually saw mountains rolling into the sea, um, they probably would have wet their pants like anybody else. But uh, they're speaking in hyperbole here uh, where they're exaggerating in order to make a point. And uh, their point is that God is bigger than any crisis. God is bigger than this corona crisis. Now, unfortunately, uh, faith in God is not like something that we can turn off and on like a, a light switch. Like, oh, okay, it's crisis time, or it's unemployment time, or it's uh, sickness time. Uh, let me throw the switch and turn on my faith. Faith doesn't work that way. Faith is more like a muscle that needs to be strengthened uh, by exercise over time. And so how can we uh, strengthen our faith? Well, it first of all begins with an understanding of what God has revealed himself to be. Uh, we uh, read the scriptures or we read a book like the, the Knowledge of the Holy One, which I would highly recommend. It blew my mind. It, it gave me a bigger view of God uh, than I had prior to reading it. Uh, and, uh, you know, but we, we need a, a good understanding of the God that has revealed himself in the scriptures. But just knowing about God is not going to carry the day. It's not going to take us through uh, the crisis. Uh, we need faith. Um, we need to believe that this is really how God is, and it affects the way that we begin to talk. It begins to affect the way that we begin to act in life. Uh, knowledge about God without, um, you know, uh, faith is like an automobile that doesn't have a transmission. What I mean by that is that, you know, you can have a great big powerful engine that can take you through any terrain and you can have the, the right wheels to take you through any terrain, but if you don't have a transmission, that's turning those wheels, then uh, it, the, the vehicle is not gonna go anywhere. And uh, faith is like a, a transmission in a car. It's the thing that, that makes it go. So by uh, 
uh, taking our steps of faith, uh, starting to talk and act like we really believe that God is who he's revealed himself to be. As we do that over time, our faith begins to strengthen uh, and we begin to know God, not just know about God, but know God as a person. Uh, I, my wife and I, uh, between dating and marriage, we've been together for 43 years. Uh, just last night it happened again, as it happens also frequently, where uh, we think about the same thing at the same time. Um, it, it's kind of uncanny, uh, but it, it happens so often, and, and it's what happens is we kind of get to, to know each other well over many years of experience. Now, I'm not saying there, there aren't still surprises along the way, there, there, there are. Uh, and, and nor am I uh, you know, saying that Martha has everything right in the way that she thinks. You know, like, uh, uh, but uh, I am saying that you know, as we've gotten to know each other, we've thought more and more uh, alike. And, and even so, we get to know God as we exercise faith not just studying about God, but exercise faith in God, uh, we begin to grow in our strength and um, in our relationship with God. And it, it's sort of like a relationship with a human being that, yeah, we can kind of know now what he's thinking in different circumstances, but there still are plenty of surprises along the way. Now, we can't turn faith on like a light switch and that could be discouraging to some but let me encourage you with this that in my personal experience with God and in my experience in pastoring uh, people over the years I've noticed that when people resolve to, to put their faith in God when they um, say God I'm going, to, I'm going to learn to trust you not just through this crisis but I really want to grow in my faith and I really want to grow to trust you. He's often very encouraging uh, to you uh, and, and, and blesses you immediately so that that snowball begins to roll and your faith begins to grow. But when I think about Jesus' words, oh you of little faith, why are you so afraid? You know, some fa fear is legitimate, right? I mean, we should have a fear in the sense that we have a healthy respect for this virus. Uh, we should have, uh, I was gonna change a, an electric socket in my house uh, from a two prong to three prong. And I went on YouTube to, to figure out how to do that. <laughs> and uh, you know, well, do you have this kind of wiring? Or do you have, the, blah, blah, blah? It went on and on, and finally I got overcome with fear uh, because he said, you know, if you don't do this right, you could ignite your house on fire. Well, so, okay, I think given my mechanical abilities, uh, you know, this was a legitimate kind of fear to uh, decide not to do that on my own. There is legitimate fear, but there's a point where our fear reaches uh, uh, a point that uh, now we're, it's actually a sinful kind of anxiety because it's something that we as believers in God do not need to worry about. And so there's a fine line between the two, I agree, but uh, as we go through this coronavirus crisis, I just want you to ask yourself, is God saying to you, oh you of little faith, why are you so afraid? He has a word of advice for us in verse 10 of uh, Psalm 43, uh, 46. And it's these simple words, be still and know that I am God. So our Father, we pray that you will quiet our hearts during this time of crisis, that you'll help us to discern between healthy respect for the virus, and when we're just becoming dreadful over things that we don't need to be dreadful over. 
Forgive us for doubting your goodness and your truthfulness, your faithfulness, your ever-present help, the promises of your word. Help us to be still and to know that you are God. Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief and increase our faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we do want to thank you for joining us on today's telecast, and we are very grateful to you folks at WVAC for allowing us to, to do this. Uh, we um, do want the Lord to bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. We do want him to protect your families and to protect your heart with a peace that transcends all understanding. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.